The Raiders continue with phase three of their offseason programs on Tuesday. I'll give you my thoughts on what I saw and what I heard, plus a whole lot more on Wednesday's edition of the Locked On Raiders podcast for May 22nd, 2024. You are Locked On Raiders, your daily Las Vegas Raiders podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome here, Raider Nation, to another edition of the Locked On Raiders podcast. Thank you so much for making the show your first listen of the day. Make sure you subscribe and follow for free on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast to get the latest edition of the show as soon as it becomes available. As always, if you're checking us out on YouTube, thank you. The show has grown so much, almost 14,000 subscriptions already to the Locked On Raiders podcast YouTube page. That is awesome. Raider Nation, thank you so much for the support. We could not do it without you, and we definitely could not do it without my man Ari. Ari does a great job each and every day, takes a lot of pride and his work getting us up on YouTube, making us look good, sound good. We appreciate his efforts. You can hit him up on Twitter, at Ari Produces. You can hit me up as well, at your boy Q254. And, of course, you want to get your feedback in on the show, always the Lockdown Raider Podcast voicemail line, 707-654-4693. Wide open, like some old school TV antennas. Coming up in segment number three, as a matter of fact, your calls and te- texts. We got plenty of feedback that I'll try to get to as much as possible. A lot of different subjects, a lot of different uh, conversations we've had here on the show. We'll continue to do that, and we'll do that in segment number three. Segment number two was out there at the Raiders facility very early on Tuesday for day two of their uh, OTAs, their phase three of their offseason program. And, uh, yeah, got a lot of observations, a lot of things that I saw, a lot of things that I heard. Want to talk about all of that. We'll do that coming up in segment number two of today's Locked On Raiders podcast. Here in segment number one, we'll talk about what I saw and heard from OTAs, but also what we heard from some of the coordinators like Luke Getze, Patrick Graham, and Tom McMahon. So let's go ahead and jump right into it. Again, it was day two of the Raiders offseason programs. Phase three, seven on seven goes on, 11 on 11 goes on. It's just ramping up, ramping up, ramping up. You know, offense on defense, a lot of coaching, lots of teaching was going on. May 20th is when they got started, so that was on Monday. Tuesday was the 21st. They're actually off today, and then they'll be back at it on Thursday, and then that portion of the phase of the offseason workout programs is over and done with. They'll have mandatory minicamp coming up sooner rather than later. But all three of the co- coordinators we spoke with on Tuesday, that's Luke Getze, Patrick Cram, and uh, Tom McMahon. And then we also talked to Tyree Wilson, Thayer Mumford, and Michael Mayer uh, after the practice as well. And you're not going to hear from any players here on today's show, but I'll tell you, Tyree Wilson, a lot more confident than he was his rookie year. You could tell that not only is he in better shape, but he's just, again, more confident, understands what he's doing, and is really ready to attack uh, his second year in the league. Thayer Mumford, he's got a little edge to him. Got a little chip on his shoulder, right? He heard all the noise all offseason long. Raiders need a quarterback, and they need a right tackle. They don't have a right tackle. Well, Thayer Mumford, who told us he was more comfortable playing the left tackle spot, said he's ready to play the right tackle spot, showing that he could be very versatile, play both. Uh, he, He had an edge, and he said he keeps receipts. So whoever he was keeping receipts of, and I know that was a conversation that all of us had, including myself. I admit it. I was one of the guys that said, hey, you know, they need to go and solidify that right tackle spot. It's been a problem for far too long for the Raiders, and it has. I didn't say anything wrong, so if he was keeping receipts on me, okay. He was keeping receipts on me, but the right tackle position needs to be solidified, but it sounds like Thayer Mumford is ready to go. And Michael Mayer, he's ready to go for his year two, fully healthy. He missed the last three games of the season with that toe injury, but he said he feels great. He feels faster. Uh, He, you know, was in a place last year in his rookie year where he wasn't having fun, didn't have a good time, times that he didn't really even want to go to work, right? Didn't want to go to the facility, didn't want to be around the guys. But uh, now he said he flipped the script, his words, not mine, and he's ready to roll, right? I asked him, is it the energy that the new new coach coach brings in and Antonio Pierce? And he said, maybe, right? He didn't go into any details. It was really a short answer. Maybe, could be, but... That was just about it. Either way, he's in a good place, ready to work with Brock Bowers, not against Brock Bowers, and thinks that they're going to be a really pretty unstoppable one-two punch. Said the offense that they're learning is a lot more simple, so he feels like that they're going to pick it up pretty quick under Luke Getze. So 
Just a little bit of a recap of what the players had to say from Tyree Wilson to Thayer Mumford and also Michael Mayer. So let's get into some of the sound that I took away, some of the sound that stood out to me from the coordinators. And we'll start with offensive coordinator Luke Getze. And, of course, it's always going to be about the quarterbacks when you start talking offense because there is a quarterback competition, Aiden O'Connell and Gardner Minshew. So here's offensive coordinator Luke Getze on the traits he may be looking for in the process of finding the Raiders' starting quarterback. I don't think traits necessarily is the right word. I think, you know, the perf- the evaluation of the performance on a whole. I think there's a lot of parts to it. I think it's the – the, the way that the operation, right, making sure we're taking care of the football and then the production part of it. I think, like you said, this is a long process. We're at the beginning stages of it. Um, everyone trying to get a grasp of what we're trying to accomplish, not just the cues, but everybody. And so it'll be, it'll, you know, the, the, the good thing is we got a good group in that, in that, uh, in that room. Those guys work their butt off and, um, they're, they're competitive, but they're great teammates, too, at the same time. So the beginning part of this thing has been a lot of fun. So not necessarily traits, but, you know, there's some things that are unnegotiable, right? And, of course, protecting the ball is one of them. Making plays is another one. Being aggressive, understanding the playbook, understanding what he's supposed to do with the ball. And so when it comes to, again, the kind of the dynamic, protecting the ball and being aggressive, here's Luke Getzey on what he said on – you know, how do you protect the ball and still be aggressive? Yeah, though, that, that's a really important. But all those factors go into it, right? If you're looking at a cue and in, and say they had nine interceptions and seven of them were at the end of a half at Hail Mary, like you just looked at the ratio and said it was two to one, right? 18-9 or something like that. But let's, let's evaluate the why or the how. I think that's what you get into. And then as you start to uh, connect to the concepts and connect to the scheme and what your approach is and why you're trying to do what you're going to do, uh, you start paying attention to the defense. And so now you say, okay, I know the way this hook defender is going to react, so I'm going to be aggressive to this throw. But when you're in those unknown worlds and you're thrown with kind of like un- uncertainty, that's when that, those are the ones that you, you can't have. And so I think as everyone starts learning the system and learning what we're trying to accomplish with each and every play, uh, then that's how you become more aggressive and more confident in what you're going to do. And then that's also leaning on your teammate, too, no, trusting that they know what they're doing and why they're doing what they're doing as well. There's Luke Getzey on uh, one of the things that are unnegotiable. Right. You got to be able to protect the ball, you know, and and if you just look at the numbers and you start to say, okay, well, this guy had this many interceptions. Okay, well, why did he have these interceptions? When did these interceptions happen? Were they, you know, just last second Hail Marys or were they, you know, they they just bad reads and bad throws and interceptions? So uh, that was a lot that, uh, you know, goes into the evaluation and he's going to have plenty of time to evaluate these quarterbacks. Obviously, it's the early stages, but Aiden O'Connell was part of the Raiders in 2023 so of course as Luke Getzey took over the job part of his job was to check check out Aiden O'Connell look at the film and see what he thought so here's Getzey on his early evaluations of quarterback Aiden O'Connell to him to get thrown into the way he got thrown into and to see the you know the adversity I mean I think it was like a zero they hadn't they didn't score and then they go score all those points I mean that's a really cool reflection of the type of kid that he is and the, and the approach that he brings. I mean, there's one thing that I would, I would, you know, definitely pat him on the back for at this point is just the the uh, willingness to be to be taught and, and you know willingness to be vulnerable in this opportunity to, to get better. I mean, it's really cool to see uh, a guy who's had success now really excited to learn some new stuff. So there you go. That was Luke Gessie, the offensive coordinator on Aiden O'Connell. And again, I really like what I'm seeing early. Very small sample size from Aiden O'Connell, right? Only really got to see him in action on Tuesday. But just knowing that he's been working on his body, uh, knowing that he finished the season really well, uh, feels like he's in a good position, but he's got to go out there and earn that job. I just feel like it's his job to to lose. And we'll obviously see up close to personal during training camp. But uh, like like what I'm seeing from Aiden O'Connell early on, and I'm sure there's going to be days when I come back and be like, man, Gardner Minshew looked fantastic. <laughs> right? Because that's just how it's going to be. That's going to be the ebbs and flows of, uh, of how training camp and the quarterback competition goes. Well, moving on to defensive coordinator Patrick Graham. Got a couple sound bites from him, and one of them was about Tyree Wilson and the fact that he moved him inside his rookie year. And uh, why was that? And will we see a little bit more of that? And uh, what has he thought about Tyree Wilson's offseason so far? Well, the move in the defensive end inside, that's always been a part of just like for any rookie edge rusher both for myself and for Robbie Leonard, who's our D-line coach, who does a great job. It teaches them to use their hands and because they're dealing with a more immediate block from the guard or the center. So I thought that was really critical to Tyree's development. That's going to help him out on the edge. 
I've told you before, we use, utilize that before in the past, the different spots I've been. So that was good. And then with the whole off season, he's doing what everybody else is doing. You know, I want to single him out, but they're all working hard. They got great uh, kinship or camaraderie going on in that D-line room, and it's, it's infectious and it's spreading throughout the defense. And you can always feel those guys out there on the field, whether you hear them or you feel them, you get, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing to see. So there's Patrick Graham on all things Tyree Wilson and why they moved him in, and uh, that's part of the process. And almost standard is what you heard Patrick Graham say. You know, it's kind of a standard practice to get those guys uh, to use their hands and get them, you know, in a position to, to understand what they're needing to do. And, you know, he's going to play outside a lot. I do expect to see him inside. Side though, the versatility is something that uh, is going to be key, especially with the defensive line that they have. Would not be shocked at all to see them tinker with Tyree Wilson and just kind of him kind of line them up all over the field, all over that defensive line, and just create a mismatch and a matchup nightmare. And again, he's in really good shape. He looks good. He's healthy, and I think Tyree Wilson is going to have an opportunity to have a a really big sophomore year with the silver and black. Another guy that had a really good year, especially towards the second uh, half of the season last year, was Malcolm Kuntz. Here's Patrick Graham on the area of growth he's seen the most from Malcolm Kuntz. From Malcolm. Okay. Um, two, week, uh, two weeks ago, we were doing drills during the phase two process, and I was in the back of the D-line group, and I just saw him coaching up one of the younger players. And I mean, coaching them up with authority. It's like this. Do that. This. Uh, once you see that, that's showing command of his his craft. And when you hear that, you know, it just again, I tell you guys all the time as a teacher who happens to teach football. I mean, I was just proud. I was giddy. You know, I mean, I don't know if a defensive coordinator should use the term giddy, but I was giddy. I mean, just to see him do that. So now you're seeing a, a, a young man, you know developing true mastery of his his craft where he's able to go ahead and you know coach others up with authority I was impressed it's just the, the confidence he has right now that got me pretty excited as you heard it got Patrick Graham pretty excited as well when he said that you know the 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 leadership the coaching up the young players and you know being very stern and and as a matter of fact with them and saying this is how we do it and saying that you know he he, he even got to the point where he got giddy uh, seeing Malcolm Coons do that. And to know that Malcolm took that step last year when really, you know, his second year in the league seemed like he was kind of non-existent, right? Really was felt like he was in Josh McDaniel's doghouse and all of a sudden really kind of opened things up in, uh, you know, in, in last year with, uh, with, with Antonio Pierce and what they were able to do in the back end of the, you know, of the season. And look, he's going into a contract year. Right. I think that he's a guy that if you look at uh, post June 1st, when that Jimmy G money comes off the books, he's probably a guy that's going to be in line for a contract extension. I think that it'd be smart for the Raiders to sign him to a contract extension before he goes out and has another big year. And all of a sudden they have to sign him to, you know, a big, massive contract. Now, of course, I don't know what the money would look like. You know, you would hope that it could be a team friendly deal. But if you're Malcolm Coons, you might say, yeah, I'll just I'll just wait. I think that I'm going to bet on myself and try to get big money. So, again, you've got to have two sides that want to negotiate. I don't know, but I think that the Raiders, if they can get him in on a, on a somewhat team-friendly deal, and I don't want to count his pockets, that would be really good. But, you know, who, who knows how that's going to shake out. I'm sure some guys are going to get contract extensions with the extra salary cap space that the Raiders do have. Uh, one more from Patrick Graham, and uh, really it's kind of taking you behind the scenes of the two tight end sets. I Obviously, the Raiders are going to be uh, using that a lot with Brock Bowers and Michael Mayer. So it kind of, as a defensive coordinator, how difficult is that to defend those two tight end sets? One, they can, they can have two three-man surfaces. You know, it's, it's a benefit for us when you have an open surface. So when I mean open surface, a two-man surface. That's a benefit. How are they going to deal with that? Especially when you have a player like Max or a player like Malcolm who's on the edge. Like, how are they going to account for him? Are they going to leave him singled or are they going to bring somebody over? Once you go to 12 personnel – you got a chance to close both uh, edges, which makes it tougher on the pass rush. Then the check with me run game that comes into play there. And then if you, if you have the unique situation of having pass catching tight ends, one time the formation can look like traditional 12. Next time it can look like traditional 11 personnel. It can look like 21 personnel. So it forces us to go through a bunch of communication 
and it's good to get that work. So Patrick Graham, again, as I mentioned at the top, you know, the coaches seemed like that they wanted to talk a little bit more, had no problem kind of taking us inside the, you know, in, inside the lab and and giving us a little bit more details than we even got last year. Last year, when we talked to the coordinators uh, early in the season, it felt like they really didn't have too much to say. Oh, well, that's not really a me thing. Well, as coach or as, you know, that's, and they, they seem like they are very short. But now they seem very, as a matter of fact, uh, they don't mind giving us a little bit more details. And you can hear that from Patrick Graham. You can hear it from Luke Getze, who obviously wasn't with the Raiders last year. But still, you felt like that these guys were willing to speak. Another guy willing to speak and was excited to speak <laughs> on, uh, on Tuesday was the special teams coordinator, Tom McMahon. And, of course, they got the new kickoff rule, and he is fired up about that. There was some extra work being done, and we'll talk about it coming up in segment number two. But, uh, man, he was he was fired up. So here's Tom McMahon talking about the new kickoff rule and he, how he feels about it and how importantly, how more importantly the players feel about it. Very excited. You know, the players are excited. If you think about it, last year in the Super Bowl, I'll just use that as an example, 13 touchbacks. You know, now it's going to be 13 balls to return. So returners are excited. Their value is going to skyrocket. So, for example, you're a kick returner. We can give it two back there, but let's just make it easy math because it's easier for me. If you have one back there and you kick off, you get 80 kickoffs, that guy's going to touch the ball 80 times possibly next year, and he's guaranteed that. Where, you know, before it's only your best receiver or your halfbacks that are guaranteed touches. This guy's going to get 80, where last year we got 11. So the value skyrockets. The value skyrockets for the position players because now they're covering every rep so the leading tackler in the league is going to probably go back to the 2000, early 2000s, 36 tackles on special teams, whereas it was only 16 tackles this last year. So their value goes way up. As coaches, you know, naturally we want to play every play. So there's going to be 10 plays a game, five kickoffs, five kickoff returns that are added into what we're grading, what we actually have to play. We can't have the out of kicking the touchback anymore. Or you're going to get the ball at the 30 and you're going to give up big drive starts. So... We love that part of it, you know, because now we're going to cover every rep. We get a chance to return every rep and got to shed, block, tackle, and teach. So there you go. You hear Tom McMahon really fired up, uh, and he was. He was fired up. I mean, that was a special team session that was fantastic. I don't think that I've ever come out of a press conference with the special teams coordinator and said, man, that was that was great. But it was the longest uh, press conference that we had out of all three of the coordinators. It was over 15 minutes long or something close to 15 minutes. Really good stuff, and it was entertaining. I feel like uh, we got a lot smarter about it. So the final soundbite that I want you to hear is also from Tom McMahon, and it's about the ideal kickoff. And, you know, is it you want to bounce it in the field of play and roll it through the end zone in order to get a touchback and they start at the 20, or is there something else that you're aiming to do? Here's Tom McMahon trying to explain what the ideal kickoff would be. Uh, there's some scheme there. I think that the, the biggest thing is, is from a rectangle standpoint, if I'm a returner, you want me to have to use the whole rectangle to get to the ball. You know what I'm saying? So there's times you could possibly pin them on the 15, which would be better than a 20-yard touchback. But the kicker's got to make this guy play the top 19-yard line to the one-yard line. You don't want a lot of balls. For example, if I catch a ball at the 10, we just gave him 10 free yards. If we get a ball in our hands at the 15, 15 free yards. Now, if they get it at the 15, but it was rolling and stopped, we just got a head start on them. Okay, so what you're really looking for is the differential between when the ball hits okay, and when they get it in their hands. How much time did we get down the field before he actually gets it in his hands? Like if you get 1.5 seconds, that's 10 yards. And he hasn't got it in his hands yet. So there's, there's some different things to look at. So there's Tom McMahon right there talking about the ideal kickoff and how their strategy involved in that and so they really worked on that they're going to continue to work on that uh, you know we saw a lot of different you know uh, scenarios that they were playing uh, as kickoff guys as return guys it was it was a lot that went into it and so uh, I'm excited to see what it's going to look like how they're going to implement and, and take advantage of the new kickoff rule and then also at the same time defend the new kickoff rule because every team is going to try to take advantage of those new rules. So that's what I got for you for seven number one on today's Locked On Raiders podcast. A little sound from the coordinators that we talked to on Tuesday at the Intermountain Health Performance Center. I know that segment went a little bit long, but segment number two, we'll talk about the biggest takeaways, things that I saw, things that I heard, the feelings that I got as I was roaming around the facility checking out practice on Tuesday. That's coming up in segment number two of today's Locked On Raiders podcast. Before we get to that, though, I do want to tell you about Yahoo Finance. And look, let's get straight to the point. 
You want to grow your portfolio to deal with the rising cost of inflation, right? You want to pay off your debt or your mortgage. Pretty much anything standing in the way of you and financial freedom. With Yahoo Finance, you can get access to the news, data, and tools that you need in order to help reach that financial freedom. When it comes to your financial future, you think you've done it all. You saved, you researched, you invested all that you can. Now you need to take those investments to the next level by using what every financial great uses, Yahoo Finance. For more than 25 years, Yahoo Finance has been the brand behind every great investor. Whether you're a seasoned investor or you're looking at extra guidance, Yahoo Finance gives you all the tools and data you need in one place. The number one finance destination producing a holistic look at the financial news cycle, including breaking news, original editorial perspectives, analyst ratings, independent research, customizable charts, and so much more. Right now, for comprehensive financial news and analysis, visit the brand behind every great investor. That's yahoofinance.com, the number one financial destination, yahoofinance.com. One more time, that's yahoofinance.com. All right, Raider Nation, here we go. Segment number two of today's Locked On Raiders podcast. Want to give you some you know, thoughts and sounds and observations from uh, day two of the OTA session that was going on at the Intermountain Health Performance Center. Of course, it's phase three of the off-season workout program for the Silver and Black. They get to do some seven-on-seven. Seven. They get to do some 11-on-11. 11 11. Uh, they get to go offense-defense, right? They get to have competition. And let me tell you, from Tuesday, there was a lot of of competition. I'll tell you off top with the 90 man roster. And this is from Tashawn Reed from the athletic and something that he's so good at is identifying what players are there and what players aren't. I've said it many times that he does a fantastic job with that. 78 players practiced during day two of the OTAs. The people who did not practice, the players who didn't go, running backs Amir White, uh, Amir Abdullah, wide receivers Malcolm G- Michael Gallup, Devontae Adams, Jalen Guyton, Tulu Griffin, offensive lineman Colton Miller, defensive end Ron Stone Jr., defensive tackle Matthew Butler, defensive tackle Nesta Jade Silvera, linebacker Darian Butler, and quarterback Jack Jones. And then also guard Jackson Powers Johnson got banged up during practice and left a little bit early. Now, when it came to Devontae Adams, a lot of people were freaking out because he wasn't there. And I know Vinny uh, pointed out on Twitter that, yeah, no Devontae Adams here at practice. Paul Gutierrez did the same thing. While I was walking around on the defensive side of things and looking at their practice and taking a few pictures and videos and tweeting them out at your boy Q254, I turned around and was walking back to the offensive side of things. And over in the rehab pool, was Devontae Adams, and he was there with a handful of guys. So Devontae was there at practice. He just wasn't practice seen. He was out there, and he was in the rehab pool. So he was definitely there and present. And again, as I mentioned, there was a handful of guys. I couldn't identify everybody, but Devontae Adams is, is pretty – you know, he's pretty obvious. He, he's, he's easy to, to spot. Uh, whenever you see his hair and he had it up so it didn't get wet, it was obvious. Oh, yeah, there goes Devontae, by the way. So he was there. He just wasn't practicing. He was in the rehab pool. And Guys like Zamir White, Amir Abdullah, Michael Gallup, Jalen Guyton, you know, any of those guys could have been in the pool with them. Colton Miller was there. He wasn't practicing, but he was there standing on the sideline. So he probably was a little bit banged up as well. Again, you don't need to stress these guys in May, right? You're worried about them being available for training camp. Jackson Powers Johnson leaving a little early. We don't know what the extent of his injury was, but he did leave a little bit early from practice. But again, like I said, there was no word on how he's doing. But those were the guys that were present, the guys that were practicing for the most part, most of the team. 78 out of 90 for voluntary workouts. It's not a bad number at all. And there was a lot of competition on Tuesday. Uh, there was a lot of guys that were, you know, getting coached up, a lot of guys that were doing a lot of teaching. Uh, there was just a, a different spirit around the facility. And, you know, for the media, for guys like me, we were able to walk around, especially during the period while we could take pictures and videos and tweet them out. And we got to see a lot more, which is great because I can come back and I can talk about what I saw and not from a mile away. Right. I can come back and say, yeah, I watched a defensive competition where, you know, they were going around the hula hoop, picking up the tennis ball. And Max Crosby wanted to make sure he won at that drill every single time. And oh, by the way, he did. Right. Uh, guys like Christian Wilkins wanted to make sure that they got after it and won. Malcolm Koontz getting after it and won. Very competitive practice. And that's what you want. Antonio Pierce has said it so many times. I want a competitive practice. I want a competitive team. I want competition at every position. And there was a lot of competition. And I'll say one thing that stood out to me in a major way, and I'll get to some positions and some players in a minute. 
during like in between sessions and while while these guys are taking a break you know there's the the cold tank there at the facility where uh you know it goes in it's very very cold so during training camp when it's 115 degrees 116 degrees they can go step in there for a couple seconds and cool their bodies off instead of going to that tank during the in-between sessions they would go over there near that cold box and they would look up and there was some video screens there there was two different video screens and the defense was looking at one and the offense was looking at the other and i'll tell you right now i thought that was the coolest thing why did i think that was the coolest thing because one of the big complaints that you know the the, the raiders as a team had with the prior staff and Josh McDaniels in particular, and this is from the NFLPA survey, is their time and maximizing their time. So what these guys were doing, after they were actually done practicing and doing a certain session and they were going to take a break, they would go over and, and, and look at film. So there was a coach right there with a control box, and he was basically going through drills and said, okay, Trayvon, this is what's going on right here. This is the look that they're showing you. This is the natural reaction. And they're doing coaching right there. So while they're cooling off, while they're relaxing, while they're you know taking a quick break, they're also learning at the same time. Instead of going through a couple hours of practice, hitting the weights, and then all of a sudden going into uh, you know a film study room for another couple hours, they're doing it all at the same time maximizing the player's time. There's one thing I hate more than anything, and that's wasting time. There's nothing worse than wasting time. I'm a dude that I have 24 hours, and I'm trying to get 25 hours out of it, right? I try to find every single day a way to get 25 hours out of 24 hours. Well, these players don't want to hang around and linger around the facility if they don't have to. So if you can go and do some study, film study like that, in between sessions, and then, oh, by the way, look at something on film and then go back and work on it. That also is something that helps. And so that was something that's new that they haven't done the, the past few years that I've been around, at least. They haven't done that. So I thought that that was a nice, uh, you know, a little little tip of the cap to the Raiders and the coaching staff for uh, putting that out there and, and being able to do it. And you saw a lot of coaching. You saw a lot of guys just, you know, in in these players' ears in, a, in again, a, a friendly coaching, teaching type way, but just showing them what they got to show and, and these players being locked in. As far as some of the competitions and some of the players that stood out, of course, you're always going to look at the quarterbacks, Aiden O'Connell, Gardner Minshew. On Tuesday, it was the Aiden O'Connell day. He did a lot better than Gardner Minshew did, and that's not saying Gardner Minshew was bad, but Aiden O'Connell was better. And that's what it's going to boil down to. Who's the best quarterback uh, to set this team up and be the starting quarterback moving forward? Aiden O'Connell did a better job. He looked more accurate. I didn't see him turn the ball over where I saw Gardner Minshew throw an interception to Luke Masterson. So uh, Aiden O'Connell looked pretty good. Uh, you know, again, it wasn't, you know, phenomenal, but for that day, it was better. Not to mention his body. He looks like he's in better shape. He's a lot leaner. Something AP has told us about that he's been working on his body, and we didn't get a chance to talk to him on Tuesday. I wanted to ask him ex exactly what he's been doing, what the end-all, be-all goal is, but we'll get to talk to him sooner rather than later. But he did look like, again, just watching him out there perform, he looked like he was in a lot better shape. Uh, the tight ends, Brock Bowers and Michael Mayer, both guys very active. Mayor had a nice touchdown catch, celebrated it, uh, let it be known afterwards that it's okay to celebrate touchdowns. Matter of fact, you should celebrate touchdowns. Again, having fun playing football is a good thing. Brock Bowers, again, as I said, after the rookie minicamp, uh, he is as advertised. He's big, he's fast, he's strong. And he was very active as well. And Dylan Lobby, the sixth-round running back out of New Hampshire, man, I said it after rookie camp that, you know, he's wearing number 23, which is the Christian McCaffrey number. I'm not saying he's Christian McCaffrey, but the Raiders are using him a lot like Christian McCaffrey. He got the ball so much on Tuesday, and he's catching a lot of passes out of the backfield. Uh, they're handing the ball to him. I mean, they were doing a lot. Hell, they even handed the ball off to Brock Bowers. There was a time where uh, he was lined up as a running back. So you could tell that versatility uh, is, is going to be key to what the Raiders are trying to do. Also, Michael Mayer let us be, know that the offense they're trying to pick up is a lot more simple than the offense that they were trying to pick up last year. So Josh McDaniel's offense, we know is very complicated. Uh, what Luke gets, he's trying to do is simplify things and make it easier. So what I say all the time, you don't want to think you want to just go out there and play. So Michael Mayer is saying that it's a lot easier to pick up the offense that, you know, they're trying to run here uh, than what it was last year. And one thing that Thayer Mumford said to me as well, I had asked him uh, how it is, you know, trying to pick up the new system as the offensive lineman. And he said, actually, it's a lot easier because it's similar to what, 
I did at Ohio State. It's more spread out. So that was something that, okay, simplistic offense, according to Michael Mayer, Thayer Munford saying it's more spread out. So I'm starting to visualize what this offense could look like. Again, small nuggets, small sample size, but I'm starting to visualize what this offense could look like just by what the players are telling us when we get an opportunity to talk to them. Max is Max. Tyree Wilson, uh, he looks like he's in great shape. Still the same weight that he was his rookie year, but he's rocked up. Right. He's he's way more cut. Uh, you know, he, he said that he, he got back to, you know, being him. Uh, he's in a comfortable place. He sounded like he was in a comfortable place. Uh, he was humbled his rookie year. He said that he was the big man on campus at Texas Tech. And then he got to the NFL and it's like, whoa, hold on. This is you know, this is a different ball game. And all of a sudden he goes from being the big man on campus to, you know, the low man on the totem pole. And I asked him, I said, when did you experience that? He said, my first game. All of a sudden, my first game, I realized, oh, man, this ain't college no more. <laughs> right. So uh, I think a, a, a refocused Tyree Wilson, a healthy Tyree Wilson, a guy who's been in Max Crosby's back pocket all offseason is going to be a good thing. So I'm excited about him, excited about Malcolm Koontz, excited about that whole defensive line. Christian Wilkins, speaking of the defensive line, he is as advertised, knocked down a pass, looked really good, was fired up, practices like he plays full speed. Go, 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 go. So him and Max, they got that same energy. And really, they set the standard, and, and really Max set the standard, but they go as those guys go. And everyone on that practice field had the same tempo. They played with the same energy and excitement as Max. Uh, Max doesn't let anyone not do that. Right. He's 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 he's, ch you know, chopping up, it, chopping it up with everybody. He's, uh, you know, um, pumping up everybody. Uh, you know, he's he's coaching them up. I mean, he, he's again, he is the standard. And it's nice to see Thayer Mumford lined up strictly as a right tackle. Uh, right. Again, again, the position that he said that he was uh, comfortable playing now. Uh, he did say that he was more comfortable playing the left tackle position, but uh, he's good at the right tackle spot. He's excited about the opportunity. He's keeping receipts for those that thought that the Raiders needed a right tackle. Uh, he's right there. He's him. <laughs> so that's cool. He's got an edge to him. I, I'm, I'm fine with that. I love the edge. Bring it. Right. And, and so, you know, if he can hold down that right tackle spot, you know who the left tackle is. That's Colton Miller. You know who the center is. That's Andre James. And you know Dylan Parham's going to play one of the guard spots. On Tuesday, he played strictly the right guard spot. Cody Whitehair and JPJ, even though JPJ left a little early, uh, they, they split time at the left guard's position. They are rotating. So, uh, yeah, it looks like Dylan Parham, again, it's early, it's, it's, it's early in, in camp. It's late May. It's not training camp even. Uh, you know, it looks like he could be sliding potentially into that right guard spot, which I'm fine with. I'm thinking it's going to be Colton Miller, then JPJ, then Andre James, then Dylan Parham, and whoever the right tackle is going to be, and it looks like Thayer Mumford might be that guy. I think that's great. A very experienced veteran, a rookie, experienced veteran, a guy who's been there, done that, experienced veteran, Dylan Parham, and then a guy in Thayer Mumford or whoever who's getting his first opportunity to be the full-time starter. So I like the balance between veterans and, and youth along that offensive line. But, again, it's small. We've only been out there for two days, rookie minicamp, and then on Tuesday for day two of, of OTAs. But so far, so good. I like what it looks like under Antonio Pierce, and I love what the coaches are doing. And they look like they're excited to be there. They're talking, they're chopping it up, and they're doing a lot of teaching. So again, so far, so good through two different practice sessions with the silver and black. What's on your mind? Your calls and text, 707-654-4693. That's coming up next in segment number three of today's Lockdown Raiders podcast. Here we go, Raider Nation. Segment number three of today's Lockdown Raiders podcast. Your calls and texts straight off that Lockdown Raider podcast voicemail line, 707-654-4693. Went a little long in segments one and two, so we'll only have time for a couple calls and texts here. Uh, we'll start off with a text from Moose from the 843. It says, hey, Q, it's Moose from the 843. Wanted to give my prediction for the upcoming season. I completely agree with you that, the, that AP is the X factor for our team. It was clear from the beginning when he took over last year that our culture was being transformed. His presence and leadership and the buy-in from the team is going to give us at least two more victories. I think the deciding factor is in quarterback will uh, play with our defense, keeping us in each game. I'm predicting a 10-7 and season with a wild card and possibly surprising everyone with a one playoff or two playoff wins. Go Raiders. That's from Moose from the 843. Thanks so much. And yeah, I mean, AP seems like the logical answer for the X Factor. I think he was the, uh, the X Factor in 2023 when he took over November 1st. And I think he's going to completely continue to be the X Factor for the Silver and Black moving forward. And, you know, I do believe, and I said this on my radio show on, on Tuesday, I believe this team is going to be better than a lot of people expect. And when I say a lot of people, I mean people outside of Raider Nation. Hell, I said it on the podcast earlier. I just think that they're going to be better than that. Now, what does that ultimately mean? Well, that's going to be up to them. 
You know what my window is. Nine and eight to ten and seven is my record, I think, overall that the Raiders, Raiders can achieve in 2024. But it's up to them to go out there and do it. But thanks for that text, my man. I do appreciate you. Up next, Tadrice in New Jersey. He's calling to ask a question about quarterback Aiden O'Connell and expectations in year number two. What's up, Q? Tadrice from New Jersey. I was calling about uh, Monday's show, and uh, I, have, I have a question for you. When it comes to Aiden O'Connell, he obviously was a rookie, and one of my sports shows that I watch on a regular basis, they were pretty much raving about him for a little bit because he had a stretch before that Minnesota game. He had a stretch where he was throwing for like 230-some yards, a couple of TDs, no interceptions. And they're like, wow, this Aiden O'Connell guy, you know, we're surprised. He might do something with the Raiders. And then we had that zero-point game and, uh, you know, lost to the Colts and the Aiden O'Connell talk kind of died away. What is your thoughts on year two of a quarterback? Sometimes a quarterback can come in and be like Aiden and then take a leap in year two. Other times they might be uh, C.J. Stroud, have a nice rookie season, and then go through a sophomore slump <laughs> where, you know, more defenses have film of the guy and figure out his tendencies. Where can you see the positives in Aiden and him making a jump in year two? Because I agree with you. I believe that Aiden can give us double-digit wins as well. With uh, I don't think we should be pounding the table for Gardner uh, again. The quarterback competition will we're, we're, we'll, uh, bear all that out, but uh, I believe Aiden can get double-digit wins, too, with the weapons that they surrounded him with and him changing his body. So thanks all, for all you do, Q. Go Raiders. Tadrice, thanks so much for the call, my man. Appreciate you as always. And, you know, I think every situation is different, right? I mean, you said it. You can go in, have instant success, and build on it, like C.J. Stroud is expected to do in Houston. You could see a successful guy in year one, possibly drop off in year two, have that sophomore slump. I mean, that's a possibility. Um, you know, I don't think that's going to happen to CJ, but you never know. Nobody's going to be surprised and shocked by what he brings to the table or the Texans for that, right? And, and quarterbacks are different. You can see a quarterback, you know, kind of struggle, get better towards the end of the season, then all of a sudden his next year have a really good season. That's what the Raiders are hoping that Aiden O'Connell can do, right? At least I think that that's what the Raiders want him to do. I know they brought in Gardner Minshew. I honestly think that that's some really good insurance. Right. And, and that's that's what you have. You know, if, if Aiden O'Connell doesn't take that next step, then you have a guy that's been there, done that, that you feel confident putting in there that he's not going to, you know, just automatically cost you a game by having him in there. Actually, he's going to go out there and he has a chance to win some games. But I do believe it's Aiden O'Connell's job to to lose. And I think that they're expecting. And when I say they, I'm talking about the team expecting him to take that next step. We'll see in Costa Mesa when they have training camp. Looking forward to that. I uh, got a text from Ohio Raiders. It says, Q, what's up? As a Raider fan, when I see the schedule come out and I see the predictions, I always say that they're hating on the Raiders. But after listening to Cynthia Freeland's conversation, I must say I have to agree with her. As we know, there's no love for our quarterback room, which I can see why when you look at the AFC. Mahomes, Joe Cool, Lamar, Josh Allen, just to name a few. However, I think this year we have a real hope and we are on our way to having a good year with Coach AP and his staff. We may not make the playoffs like we all want, but... We just need to trust the process and have some patience, Raider fans. Things are looking up in Raider land. That's from Ohio Raider in the 419. I agree. I, again, I, I've said it before, uh, you know, and I understood Cynthia's piece, and that's why I had her on the show, and that's why I brought that sound to the podcast, because I wanted her to have a chance to explain. And even she, you know, was kind of like, I'm going against my models. I feel like I should go against my models, that they may be underestimating the Raiders. It's just looking at the Raiders on paper and looking at the quarterback room on paper. You know, people are downplaying and saying, yeah, uh, I don't think that they're going to be very good. But with everything that they have going on around them, they really have a good chance to be a good team and, you know, potentially win, like I said, nine games, ten games. You know, you get the double-digit wins, you have a chance for the playoffs. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but you do have a chance if you get double-digit wins. Thanks so much for that text. I do appreciate you. We'll close things out with a call from Jacob in Hanford. He's calling to ask a few questions about what I've been seeing from media availabilities. Here he is, Jacob in Hanford. What's up, Q? This is Jacob from Hanford. I got two questions for you this week. One is Aiden O'Connell and Gardner Minshew. I, I looked at, you know, what's available to us, to the public, you know, some of the videos that you guys are able to record and what's put out there. Uh, we're just seeing little drills, you know. Nobody was really getting hit or getting pressured or anything like that. But Aiden seems to be doing really well. He's a lot more consistent, at least, from my, from 
from my view, it seems like he's the most consistently accurate quarterback out there. Are you seeing the same thing I'm seeing, or is it pretty even? Tell me what you think about that. Number two, our return game. Is DJ Turner the guy? How's he looking? Do we have somebody else that seems like they might take that position from him this year? You let me know, Q. You take it easy. Go Raiders. Jacob, thanks for the call. Appreciate you as always. Aiden O'Connell and Minshew, who looks better at this stage of the game? To be honest, I mean, it was one day. O'Connell looked good on Tuesday, right? That's the first time I've got to see him up close to personal. Right, we've never seen those guys. We didn't see them at rookie minicamp because they're not rookies. So all we really got a chance to see so far was Tuesday, and O'Connell was the guy. Uh, but Minshew, you know, I think he's gonna be fine. You know, again, it's a small sample size, but you know, we'll see. As far as the return game goes, now that's a good question. You know, I think the Raider, Raiders have options. You mentioned DJ Turner, definitely an option. Rook and Dylan, Dilly, Dylan Lobby, definitely an option. Tulu Griffin, the wide receiver out of Mississippi State, undrafted free agent, an option. You know, I think there's going to be some good competition there. Even Trey Tucker, he could be involved in the competition as well. So I think that the Raiders have different options, different guys in mind, and that's going to be another, you know, competition that we watch in training camp and see who picks it up, especially when it comes to the new kickoff rule. And I mentioned it before that they worked on it quite a bit on Tuesday, and, you know, they did where Daniel Carlson was kicking. You saw A.J. Cole kicking, just kind of like – drop kicking the ball to the returner so they had chances and then they had the jugs machine out there uh and you know just kind of uh you know pooching balls to to the returners and making sure that it bounced on the ground and they had to come up and field it and you know it was almost like a shortstop fielding a, a ground ball or whatever and there was times where guys struggled right the ball would get past them and get you know through their through their their hands and you know back in the day when the ball went into the end zone and just rested there it's it's a touchback well now it's a live ball so they have to get on it, which, thank God, I'm so tired of seeing the ball just go over these guys' heads and it drops in the end zone, and then it's a touchback. Remember back in the day when the ball used to just hit the ground and it was a live ball? Well, it's a live ball again. So that's exciting. And, you know, the Raiders coaches have to pound that into these players that, hey, it's a live ball. Don't let it just lay there. And that happened right in front of us, right? A ball got by one of the, the returners, and, you know, he it rolled into the end zone, so he's like, oh, he's not going to touch it. And the coach came yelling, hey, live ball, live ball, that's a live ball. They've got to remember that because it's not been a live ball for a while. So now they got to get back to actually getting on the ball, downing the ball, if they want it to be a touchback. They can't just let it fall and drop and think that, okay, it's all good. I put my arms out, so that means I'm giving up. No, you've got to get on it. You You have to treat that like a live ball because that's – what it is so that's going to be something to see you know how the Raiders adapt to that how they take advantage of it how they defend that and how other teams in the league do as well so thanks so much for that call I do appreciate you uh, I got a text from just win will we'll get to that tomorrow Raider Izzy we'll get to that call tomorrow a text from Todd in San Diego all that plus more coming up tomorrow on uh, the Lockdown Raiders podcast so until then Raider Nation take care of yourself take care of your family love on your family most importantly as always just win baby